Hey, I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN, and this week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion on our 39th president, who was a peanut farmer, a U.S. Naval Academy graduate, and a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Former President Jimmy Carter is the subject of Marquette University political science professor Julia Azari. She describes President Carter's life and how he reimagined the presidential primary contest. Welcome to the... Poli-Sci 4299 and also some uh, graduate students sitting in the back. I've got enough handouts for you all. And of course, greetings to our uh, friends watching this on the C-SPAN Lectures in History series. So just a quick reminder, on on Thursday I'm going to circulate the writing assignment and give back the tests. I know that we are getting very close to spring break, so if you're not able to make it, you'll have opportunities to uh, get the assignment on D2L and ask plenty of questions, and I've, of course I'll hand uh, exams back after the break as well. Um, all right, any logistical questions about that? Okay, then I'm going to get us started with our scheduled program here. Today we're talking about the presidential legacy of Jimmy Carter, who was president from 1977 to 1981. Um, our, our lecture is titled, Why Not the Best?, which was also the title of Carter's campaign biography, and I think really gives us some, some insight. So keep that title in mind as we think about, uh, about Carter's political project and, and legacy. So I'm going to start us off here um, with, with Jimmy Carter in the news. So a couple weeks ago, it was announced that, that former President Carter, who is 98 years old, is going to live out the rest of his days in home hospice. And this kind of kicked off a lot of reassessment, a lot of conversation about Carter's presidential legacy and legacy in the world, some of which you read about today. Um, but up until this point, Carter's had a pretty kind of negative legacy and is often at the bottom of lists of great presidents. And you kind of see this here. Here are a couple of, these are both conservative news sites comparing Democratic presidents to Jimmy Carter. And these are kind of intended to be unflattering sorts of, of comparisons. And especially with inflation, which we'll talk about, you've gotten a lot of comparisons between, um, between Carter and Biden. But you see it didn't start there. There's also some comparisons with, um, with Barack Obama. But lately, as you saw in the piece that you read, there's been this kind of reassessment and resurgence of thinking about the significance of Jimmy Carter as an individual and as a president, and really kind of rethinking what happened not just in his post-presidency, which has been very famous for all of the public service that he's done, but also like really rethinking, um, rethinking Carter's time in office and its, and its significance. Anyone have any preliminary questions or thoughts on this before I launch into the rest of, of this bit? OK, we talked a couple weeks ago. We would kind of brainstormed about what do, we, what do we know about Carter. And I kept that in mind as I put this all um, together. So I'm going to actually start with a little personal 2006 story. So in 2006, I was doing some dissertation or some research for my doctoral dissertation, and I was doing some archival work at the Carter Presidential Library, mostly reading files exchanged by Carter's speechwriters and communications team. And the, the Carter Presidential Library is located in Atlanta. It's it's on the same grounds as the Carter Center, which is the area where the Carters um, have, it's sort of their launching point for all of their humanitarian work. The Carter Center has done a lot of election monitoring and other kind of global democracy promotion activities. So it's a really big center. It's August, new class of interns, folks like yourselves were probably arriving at the Carter Center. And as I was leaving the archives one day, I, I really thought I'd spent too much time in the archives and that I was hallucinating because I'm like, I'm pretty sure I just saw President Carter and his wife. And so I saw one of the, the archival staff walking out. And she was like, did you see the president? Did you go say hi? Did you shake his hand? And then I saw like security detail, you know, a couple of feet away. And I was like, oh, that actually was President Carter. Well, I, sh I guess I should go say hi. So I kind of chased him down, which I don't recommend um, with former world leaders. And went up and introduced myself to, it was him and his, his, his wife, Rosalind, uh, introduced myself and immediately started babbling, which will probably not be that surprising to any of you. And, um, 
and said, you know, I've been reading a bunch of your speeches for my dissertation, and I'm in grad school and whatever. I said, and I, so, but I said, I've, I've been reading a lot of your speeches, and he just looked at me and said, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, which was very funny and kind of unexpected. But also, it, it kind of actually rang a bell in my head. So this is 2006, right? Let's think about that context. At that moment in time, you have this kind of building cynicism in, in the country, specifically, this is the administration of George W. Bush, which we'll cover later in the semester, about the way that that administration, what they did, but also how they talked about what they did. Um, there was a kind of growing sense that the public had been lied to, a growing sense that we weren't really getting the full story about the kinds of trade-offs involved in, in governance, and there wasn't a lot of humility in, in that rhetoric. And that was really what it appealed to me as a grad student reading Carter's speeches, it really struck me. So I don't have living memory of this administration, but I was reading all of these speeches and thinking, wow, when Carter speaks, he talks about trade-offs. He says, look, you know, here, is, here are sacrifices we're gonna have to make, here's what, work, here's what will work, here, here's what may not work. And speaking about his own election to office, he talked a lot about keeping campaign promises. But he also kind of had this, this comment once in, uh, back and forth with the media where he says, you know, I didn't win by that much. It was a very close election. Um, and just kind of had approached that with a sense of humility. And so at the time, I remember thinking this is really different than any kind of presidential speech or rhetoric that I have encountered before. And that, that really stayed with me is um, not only as I wrote my dissertation and book about, uh, about presidential mandate claiming, which I'll get to talk about the kind of significance of Carter there um, at the end, but also in putting, this, in putting this together, I want us to kind of think about this framework. So here's where we're, here's where we're gonna go. Here are some themes. Um, the first one, I want us to kind of think about Carter's pathway to the presidency, not just the election and the nomination contest, although you all know I love those, but also about what he was responding to. So this is really what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks in this class, about what was going on leading up through the 60s and the 70s. So we know quite a bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk about that. I want to talk about his policy priorities and general approach to the presidency, what was accomplished, what wasn't accomplished, but also uh, kind of the politics of that. And then finally, the, the big question, the legacy. What does this all mean for American politics? And then finally, I want to end by talking about Carter as a transition point. Again, I'm kind of using my own work as a, as a jumping off point, but why Carter is in the class, this sort of transition point also between our two, our two units, as well as a transition point in, in the, the presidency and its role in American politics. All right, any preliminary questions, comments, concerns? Okay. So we're gonna start with our political backdrop here. Again, this is really familiar territory to you all. So here we've got President Richard Nixon, um, the last president elected before, before Carter. There's this brief uh, Gerald Ford uh, interlude after Nixon resigns in Watergate. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? This is a real moment of a kind of declining trust in, in the government, declining trust specifically in the presidency and this idea that a lot's going on in the presidency, that one person has a lot of power and a lot of people working kind of directly for them and that they're really able to use public resources for private good or for their own kind of political ends. In the country by 1976, remember Watergate, his, Nixon's resignation's in 74. So by 1976, when Carter's running for president, that is still pretty fresh in people's minds. Now, delving further back than that, we've also talked quite a bit about what was going on in the Democratic Party. We talked a lot about the kind of chaotic ending of the Lyndon Johnson administration. Um, in, 19, in 1968, right? And that has also got some implications for, for Carter. We talked about this country's kind of sense that Johnson had gone back on campaign promises around the war in Vietnam, that they had been lied to about that war by multiple administrations. And also we have a Democratic Party that's kind of crumbling around the issue of civil rights. 
And we, we talked a bit about that kind of impact on the broader political situation. And of course, that's going to press at some real pain points in the Democratic coalition. So in, in comes Jimmy Carter. He's both a Southerner, not just from, from the border south, but from the deep south, from Georgia, but also a repu has a reputation as a racial liberal, as someone who's kind of stood up to some of these segregationist Southerners, as someone who has a kind of forward-looking vision on race. And so one thing that, that Carter kind of exemplifies in this coalition is somebody who can actually bridge this really painful divide in the coalition. You know, it's, it's morally painful, it's also politically painful. And that gives Carter, that's one of the ways that Carter has kind of an in. There's a couple other things, there's a couple other things going on here. By 1976, the country has kind of a new presidential nomination system. And whereas before, if you wanted to get nominated as president, we've talked a lot about these conventions, right? We've talked a lot about 19th century presidential nomination conventions. You had to really get in good with the delegates to those conventions. Well, now, as of 1976, the system is starting to look like the one that, that you know, that we know. And what you need to do is do well in the primary system. You need to, in order to win delegates, you've got to win state by state primaries. And they're in this all crazy order, and some states are early, and some are late, and they're all over the country. And the system, again, is like relatively new at that point. No one really knows how to game it. No one really knows how it works. No one really knows how to strategize. And Carter's able to take advantage of that and think through his own strategy. There's some, some strategy, some luck. And he goes to Iowa. We now know, I know I've, I've talked with a couple of you outside class. I don't think we've talked a lot about the Iowa caucuses. But they're, you know, now they have this kind of common importance. Um, that wasn't so much the case in 1976, but Carter took advantage of this. He was this very little known one-term governor from Georgia. He was in the state legislature before that. Not a big national figure. But he's able to go to Iowa and meet people and really appeal to the voters there on the basis of his kind of personal characteristics. And this is where that other piece of the political backdrop is so important. He really kind of presents himself as somebody who's going to be honest, someone who is an evangelical and born-again Christian and has a sort of deep moral kind of basis, deep, deep kind of faith basis for his, his worldview and his morality. And this is, maybe this all, like we're used to hearing about religion and politics now, but at the time this was a little bit different, a little, hit a little bit differently. And was really appealing if you think about the Nixon administration, if you think about the Johnson administration, the way the public felt so alienated and lied to. Carter kind of comes in and says, I am different from all that. I'm an outsider. I'm not part of this Washington mess. I'm not part of what's gone wrong over the last decade or so. And that really lands with this kind of crucial voters. And after doing well in Iowa, Carter is able to get a lot of media attention. And that kind of becomes known after that as the way, the way that you win a presidential nomination, is you land in these early contests, and then you get a kind of national media presence. So already, we're starting to see that even though we might think of Carter as the person in those early slides, the person, the president who other presidents don't want to be compared to, we're already starting to see how, nevertheless, the things that he did were actually really consequential and kind of helped create the system that we now understand for how presidents relate to the, their, the people, their parties, and how they sort of position themselves. And this becomes very common as this kind of outsider. The last thing I want to point out here is something that is really obvious, and yet that you don't hear a lot about, especially in light of Carter's very service-heavy post-presidency. And that is that to be in this kind of position, to, to come at this and say, OK, I'm this outsider. I'm from Georgia. I'm, you know, I'm really just coming at this for public service and my values. But to really go from being a state-level politician in Georgia to being, like, I'm in a run for president, you have to have some serious political ambition. You have to really be ambitious. And that's a kind of a piece of the Carter persona, the piece of the person that Carter was in the 1970s that is often lost as people talk about him as this kind of selfless public servant. And I don't think it takes away from that selfless public, public servant narr narrative 
to also emphasize how how ambitious Carter was. And the way that we think about those things going together, that's one of the questions I want to pose to you at the end. You know, why do we think of these things as being so deeply incompatible? OK, questions. So just a little bit about the about the general uh, the general election here. So again, Carter kind of runs in this in this weird way. He positions himself as not really liberal and not really conservative. He kind of positioned himself as the conservative in the um, in the primary race to let all the liberal Democrats knock each other out. Um, but of course, to win um, to really consolidate the coalition. He has to have some liberal ideas. He's still a Democrat, but he's just kind of like ideologically ambiguous. He talks about government efficiency, about tax reform, about welfare reform, about things we might think of as more conservative, but he's also very concerned about the plight of people less fortunate, as we'll talk about later. He does bring this sort of moral vision to a lot of his policy issues. So, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint ideologically, and it's hard to pinpoint in terms of where the two parties have been up to that up to that point. Um, but it, he really emphasizes this idea of why not the best? That the American government, one of his other texts is a government as good as its people. That the American people, he kind of like builds on this sense that the American people are fundamentally good. It's the people are good and they deserve a better government. They deserve a good government. And so we kind of might have some questions about, okay, what is that? What is a good government? Who gets to decide? Who are, who are the winners and losers of a good government kind of political philosophy? We're going to find out. And that is a harder set of, of political appeals. And, and the result is very close. So he wins with just 50%, just over 50% of the vote. And the other thing about this map is that it's very weird. It is a weird map. Does anyone have any observations about how this is different? We've looked at a lot of these maps. And we've thought a little bit about their geography. Any, any observations here? It's a little tricky, but you know, we looked at normally when we look at these maps. One of the things we've observed is the sort of dynamic between the middle and the kind of coasts, right? And we've seen that not just in contemporary maps, but in some older maps. And the other one is the north and the south. Carter, you know, he's from the south. He kind of locks up the south. But if you looked at this map from 1976, you might come away and say. Huh, the United States has this deep east-west divide. And you don't really get that from a lot of other, a lot of other electoral maps. Because again, it's sort of like a middle and coast dynamic that we're used to seeing. Or if it's more geographic, it's north-south. Why is that? Honestly, that is a really interesting question that hasn't gotten a lot of the same attention that some of these other questions have. Um, some of it might be kind of a party politics story about the Republican Party. Um, under Nixon investing not just in the South but in the West. Some of it is probably a kind of state politics story. You know, there's a couple different theories, but it's, it's actually a really, I think, kind of fascinating open, uh, open question. But once Carter wins, he's got to face this question. It's one thing to appeal to the voters with this kind of broad set of ideas about good government. Who's going to say they don't like good government? This is a trick question. Because once you start governing, it turns out good government is a lot more controversial than you might imagine. So this campaign to governance transition for Carter, it's always hard. It's always hard. But it really proves to be kind of tricky for, for the new Carter administration. Here I want to talk a little bit, before we get into policy, about Carter's approach to the presidency. And this was a lot of what I was, what I was researching and writing about back uh, back in the day. So this is Carter with his um, Office of Management and Budget uh, Director, Bert Lance, his friend from Georgia who came with him. And Carter, again, had run in the nomination race, had run in the general as, I am going to be a leader of good government. This is going to be clean government, be not corrupt government, honest. And then Bert Lance gets implicated in a banking scandal. This is like the highest you know, economic official in the administration. And he gets accused of some financial corruption back in Georgia. He actually gets cleared of it a couple years later in 1980. But 
Carter can't wait around for that. And so eight months in, Bert Lance resigns because he's, his alleged behavior has already undermined this promise. And it turns out promising you're going to be transparent, accountable, not corrupt at all times, this turns out to be a very kind of tall order in, in politics. And so Carter has already kind of set himself up for some challenges. There's also this kind of imagery element to it that is quite, I think, quite fascinating. Carter really tries to bring down the level of the image of the White House. So using a lot of kind of public-facing symbolism to respond to this, this political environment of, of Watergate, Vietnam, and this kind of sense that the government has gotten out of touch with the people and out of control. So Carter He's inaugurated uh, wearing just like a regular suit and not like a more formal uh, kind of attire. He's actually the first president to get out of the, the motorcade and just walk along Pennsylvania Avenue in the inaugural parade, which now is common. And Carter did it, and it was just kind of like a little innovation. Like, I'm just out here with the people. Um, he sold the presidential yacht, the Sequoia, which was not only a, a nod to being less fancy, but also being a little more frugal a little more careful with public money to try and give, give that kind of impression. And one of the things that you really literally, if you read, like if there's a new presidential biography of, of Carter that goes, has a lot of kind of depth about what people were saying, they actually complained about people wearing jeans in the White House. That it was, you know, it looked dirty, it looked disorganized. Carter himself would wear jeans sometimes in the White House, and so would some of his aides. And he brought in a bunch of people from Georgia that were referred to as the Georgia Mafia, people who didn't have a lot of national, uh, national political experience. So we've already got a very different kind of presidential style and their substance, their style. They've set a high bar for what they're going to do. Um, and they've brought it down in a way that doesn't necessarily sit well with everyone. One of the things that Carter did that was unpopular was he uh, asked that they stop playing Hail to the Chief when he came into the room. And it turned out people like, people like a, little circum a little bit of kind of ceremony around the presidency. Anyone have questions or comments on any of this? So this is something that's been, I think, kind of lurking throughout the semester. We haven't. We haven't dealt with it totally head on, but we've been kind of talking about these themes, this kind of balance the president's need to strike between being one of the people, just a regular citizen, accountable to the people, right? They're not special. We don't have a monarchy. But at the same time, they have a lot of power. And we, in some ways, we do want them to be a little special, or we want the office to be a little special. And Carter comes in like right at that point of, of tension. The other part of this that, that I want to talk about here is how, how this plays out with Carter once, once he's done running against Washington. And now he's, now he's in Washington. And not only is he of the political establishment, but he's got to deal with the people there, all the people he's been you know, kind of running against. Because he's not just, in 76, he's not just running against Nixon and Johnson and, and Ford, his actual opponent. But you know, running generally against the kind of culture and way people do things in Washington. But then you, you get to Washington and you realize, oh, those same people, they're still in Congress. You have to deal with them. They're in your own party. You, if you want to get anything done, you've got to deal with Congress. Hopefully this is also a, a theme we've taken from the class. We've talked a lot about presidents being kind of embedded in the other branches. Um, and so one of the things that Carter wants to do is really speak to the people about all these new things that he, he wants to do, all these changes that he wants to make. And again, now we kind of think about the president speaking directly to the people on TV or through any various forms of media that we might have or at a live event. It's pretty normal. And it wasn't a new thing in 1976. But what we haven't really talked about when we've talked about president speaking directly to the people is this can create a little bit of a tense dynamic with Congress. So when you go to the people and you're like, here's what we're going to do. Here's the kind of legislation I want Congress to pass. Here's how we're going to solve this problem. Like, as we talked about in the beginning of the semester, Congress is the first branch. Congress can be like, I'll see, we'll see about that. Who actually passes the laws here? Members of Congress. 
And they may not want the president just telling them what to do. They don't work for the president. And so we can kind of see how that creates a little bit of, of tension there with the president being speaking directly to the people. This was a big theme in, in Carter's speechwriter files as I was, as I was kind of going through them, is that they wanted to make sure they set a tone. They wanted to communicate with the people in an effective way and talked about their values and talked about what the policy agenda would be. And obviously, public opinion was really important to them. But there was also a lot of debate about, well, OK, there are, so looking at this big energy bill, which we'll talk about in a moment, and there's this big back and forth between Carter speechwriters about if we're, if we're going to give two speeches, like that could be one way if you have to address multiple audiences, right? But they're like, OK, if we speak to Congress first and then to the people, then the people are going to feel like we're not being honest with them. They're going to feel like there was one speech for the governing elites and one speech for the general public. That's exactly what we said we weren't going to do. But if we speak to the people first and then Congress, then Congress, well, the words they use in the memo are Congress will be pissed. Um, that Congress will feel like they are you know, being, that we're going over their heads. Literally something that also comes up in these memos. We don't want to go over the heads of Congress. You want to show respect to Congress. But you also want to show respect to the American people. And those may be, in, in the mind of the administration, somewhat different kinds of messages. So we've already got all these kind of approach and stylistic tensions, and we haven't really even gotten to the policy agenda. Do you have any questions so far? What questions do we have? We're good? OK. All right. So this is a list of, of some of Carter's policy priorities. It reads like a chart at the eye doctor. It starts big. It gets small. Um, so many, so many policy priorities. Um, and if we think about these in a little bit of detail, we can also see how they might relate or not relate to the, the main priorities of the Democratic Party that, that Carter was now leader of. So we've got energy. That's something we often hear associated with Carter now is his sort of environmental orientation. We've got foreign policy. And we've got all this other stuff, right? Healthcare, the economy, which is almost always forefront in people's minds, and especially in the 70s is forefront in people's minds. Carter is a big advocate of consumer protection and deregulation of industries, which he thought would be better for, um, for consumers. Um, we've got urban politics. We have all of these different things that, uh, that Carter wants to be, wants to address. Who is, who's in the photo? Anybody recognize the person with Carter in the photo? You got it, Chris? Biden. That is Joe Biden, a new new Senator Joe Biden. Um, yeah, so they were they had a uh, sort of close relationship early on. Biden was an early uh, endorser. Um, so yeah, so one of the things that we take from this is like on the one hand, Carter's got a lot of ideas, a lot of vision, a lot of things he wants to get done. And spoiler alert, actually a lot of things do get done. When you look at this administration and you look at what actually got done, there's actually quite a lot of legislation passed. There are some, there are some real foreign policy low points, but there's also some achievements. It's not a do-nothing administration. It's one of the kind of puzzles of, of studying Carter. But it is also the case that when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And the, the final part of this is that Carter himself was coming to this not only with his Georgia political background, but also his background as an engineer in the Navy. Somebody who was really into details, quite a reader. People who were around him at that time described him as, as an intellectual, as somebody who really did his homework, um, but also as somebody who really had a tendency to really want to be involved in all of the details. And when you're the president, and this is your agenda, you can't be involved in all of the details. So some of, this is, some of this has to do with the coalition. Some of this has to do with the nature of prioritization. And some of it has to do with Carter's kind of political and individual style. So I'm going to talk us through a couple of these policy areas. And this is really going to be not a very deep dive in each of these policy areas. One of them is energy. So energy had been an issue throughout the 70s um, with gas lines and shortages of fuel. And Carter had a couple of priorities going forward. 
One was energy independence, so the U.S. wouldn't be so vulnerable to whatever was going on in the Middle East or other oil-producing countries. And that kind of fed into the idea, to some of the more environmental ideas about um, developing alternative fuels and stuff like that. Also, Carter had this kind of consumer orientation, and so he wanted costs to be lower for the consumer. These two things already don't always mesh, and then you add in politics. So we have these very ambitious plans about what to do to deregulate nat natural gas, um, change the regulation system around that, to develop taxes, to decrease consumption. Um, you have uh, this very ambitious kind of plan going to, going to Congress, trying to uh, get public investment in alternative fuels. So there's like 100 items in the first legislative request that, that Carter sends to Congress. There are a couple of issues. One is that we've still got a, a Democratic Party that has strength in the South and in places like Louisiana where oil is a big part of the economy. And so to the extent that Carter was asking for things that would benefit consumers at the expense of industry, and that was very much Carter's orientation, they're not all going to go for it because that's, that's their voters. That's their base. Those industries are important. So you've got a little bit of this kind of push and pull in the Democratic Party in the 70s. It's a little bit different than how we might expect it to be uh, constituted today. Um, Although some of these issues are still a problem. You still run into the problem where there's like a big picture environmental idea that might benefit everybody, but it's not good for certain industries and those industries are very important to members of Congress. That dynamic persists today. It looked a little bit different in the 70s. Um, so Carter's got this really complex congressional situation. The House and the Senate pass different versions of the bill. They don't agree on the details of natural gas regulation. Um, I can send you all some articles from the 70s if you want to read those. Um, but, you know, so it, part of it for Carter is it looks like he doesn't know how to negotiate with Congress. It looks like he doesn't have good legislative skills. And ultimately what, what Congress passes is it's a pretty big bill. It makes changes. It does deregulate the natural gas industry, it creates the Department of Energy. It, I think by 21st century standards, we would consider this a fairly major piece of legislation. But it's only watered down compared to what the administration had wanted. And so it, it makes people on the left mad. It makes environmentalists mad. People who oppose it, the industry, and people who are not interested in these changes are also mad. And Carter comes off sort of looking weak and being depicted in the media as being a bad, a bad legislative leader. So we have a, a pretty solid policy success but the politics of it are just keep sort of getting away. If that wasn't complicated enough for you, now we've got foreign policy. And this is actually a very active foreign policy presidency. And there's, there's a couple ways we can kind of break this down analytically. Your reading actually did a pretty good job. It was a short reading, but had, um, I think, a pretty good overview of some of this key stuff. Some of this comes, we're going to start again with Carter as a person, Carter's kind of values as a person. Human rights were really important to him. He wanted to have his foreign policy be guided by a sense of the kind of good of people in the world. That sounds great. Again, who's going to be against human rights? You ask that question in a campaign, very few people. You ask that question in a governing context, and things change. It's very guided by, uh, by the politics of human rights. Also, he has this kind of approach of, we're going to approach things like an engineer. We're going to break down the problem. We're going to analyze it. We're going to look at its different parts. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes that's valuable, and other times that's kind of set, goes afield of the politics of the situation. Um, in the human rights orientation, it, Carter kind of quickly learns that that's, it's one thing to do that with countries that aren't especially powerful. It's another thing to do that with countries where the United States has either an alliance or is involved in a sort of complex set of, of rivalries like the Soviet Union. So I, I'm just going to sort of go through the list here of a couple of the things. Carter starts out with um, negotiating the Panama Canal Treaty. To give, to give the canal back to, um, to the people of Panama. And 
this was not Carter's idea. This had been in the works for about a decade, but Carter was the one who really pushed it in Congress and it became really contentious. It became really contentious around, will this put US interests at risk in the region? Why are we giving this back? Um, and so even though it happens, again, the politics of it kind of get away. And it fits into this larger narrative of Carter making the country seem weak on the national stage. The other piece of this is, is relate, the relationship with the Soviet Union. And this is complex and evolves over, um, over time. So Carter enters into, into talks and trying to reduce um, nuclear weapons. Carter wants to actually approach that relationship with more of a human rights framework and less of a power politics framework. And that works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it also makes a kind of pressure point with this human rights thing. Because on the one hand, Carter really wants to push that, and there are a lot of human rights abuses in, in the former Soviet Union. But on the other hand, you know, that, makes, that makes for kind of negative set of negotiations. You're really trying to have a relationship with a country. They can, they can refuse to meet or talk to you or do what you want or negotiate with you if you call out their human rights abuses. So that creates this kind of political incentive for Carter to, to downplay that, even though it's a very significant moral issue. Later in Carter's presidency, uh, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, and that becomes another thing that Carter has to, um, has to react to. Reacts by, by pulling out of the Olympics, ending some, some trade deals over things like wheat, but also not getting involved on the ground. And so it's, that's another piece of kind of reassessing Carter's legacy is what, how, do we re, how do we assess what didn't happen? How do we assess the stuff that he didn't do? Um, next up we've got from Carter's first year, the Camp David Accords. So this is um, sitting down with the leaders of, of Israel and Egypt and um, putting together a, a peace agreement, negotiating a peace agreement, something that was a really high priority for Carter. Um, and won a, a Nobel Peace Prize, not for Carter, but for the other two leaders involved. You read about this a little bit. So this is another, becomes another piece of this really, it's a really big foreign policy accomplishment, but how high is this on the priority agenda of, of the American people? What constituency in the Democratic Party does this speak to? And you can think about, you know, there are people who care about it, of course, but it's not going to be a top line issue the way something like the economy and inflation are. So Carter really is like very foreign policy forward. In his first year, he wants to get a lot done. And some of his advisors are like, you know, we need to do stuff that that our voters are going to care more about. We need to attend not just to the policy side of this, but also to the politics side of that. And this discrepancy between politics and policy is just going to come up again and again as we, as we talk about Carter. Um, and then got our, our last, we're still not done with foreign policy. This is like the most we've talked about foreign policy all semester. Um, is we've got the Iranian revolution and hostage crisis. Yet another thing that Carter really has to react to. Um, in an already very, very tense situation, and his his botched attempt to rescue American hostages in Iran who were there for a year becomes a, just a really bad piece of kind of um, bad campaign imagery, bad imagery of the success of the administration. They they try they send helicopters to try and rescue the hostages. They fail. The helicopters crash. Um, eight soldiers die, and that just looks really bad for the administration. So they're not able to control those events. They're not able to control what happens in the internal domestic politics of another country. Um, and that becomes another kind of challenge. But then on the other side of the ledger, we have normalizing relationships with China, creating a diplomatic relationship with China, very big accomplishment. So it's really complicated um, to put Carter's foreign policy into a box. And it also speaks to this sort of difficulty of controlling a main political, main political narrative. If you make foreign policy the centerpiece of your administration, that's great. But first of all, people don't pay a lot of attention. And second of all, you're really vulnerable to, to external events that you've got no control over whatsoever. We have a couple more policy priorities, then we'll get into to legacy. You read a bit about this for today, good government. I asked earlier, what, is, what does good government mean? 
Does anyone have any suggestions? What is good, what is good government in this, in this context? One of the things that Carter kind of emphasizes is waste. Making government more efficient. Being more, a more careful steward of public funds. And so he goes after these little local projects that Congress is passing, these district-based water projects. This is in your reading. Kind of goes after those. Does this remind you of anything? You've got a president who says, look, I'm the national leader. And I'm going to push back on, these, on this, local, this local stuff. Pat? Andrew Jackson. Yeah, so a little bit of Andrew Jackson and, and what? Uh, the, the vetoing of the Maysville Road. Right, exactly. You've got the vetoing of the Maysville Road, sort of like some echoes of the, the bank war here. Right? We see this come up again and again in presidential history, this idea that the president is like, I've got the big picture idea. Members of Congress are just being a little bit a little bit parochial and narrow in their vision. But they also they have a tendency to come back and say maybe so, but this is what my constituents want. And in order to get a law passed, you need Congress to vote on it. The president can't pass laws. And that's pretty much what happens with this water project. Carter goes after it. Other Democrats are mad, and they end up cutting out about half the projects. Um, but it mostly, again, just kind of comes back on the administration. He's, he's going after these things that are important to members of his own party. And so he's legislating badly, even as he's trying to do good government. This, so I'm talking about inflation here just kind of briefly. Here's a, the cover of Time, Carter versus Inflation. So it's kind of taken on new, uh, new relevance as we're dealing with inflation again. Inflation then was about twice what it is now, if um, at the end of Carter's presidency. And I've just got here a little bit of text from a speech that he gave in the fall of 1978 about inflation and what he's going to do about it. He's, we're going to hold down federal uh, government spending. We're going to slash federal hiring, get rid of needless regulations, bring back competition. What, what ideology does this sound like? What party does this sound like? Does it sound liberal or conservative? What do you think, right? More conservative. Yeah, so this is kind of you know, not typically what you expect to hear out of, out of a Democratic president. And it sounds a lot like what you're going to hear when we get to, to Carter's successor, Ronald Reagan. We're seeing this very different kind of very different kind of Democrat and very different kind of uh, Democratic administration really moving away from some of the main points of, of the Democratic Party and going up to that going up to that point. And that again just makes him even more on the outs with other Democrats and specifically with the liberal wing of the of the Democratic Party and the kind of traditional New Deal wing. So I'm, I'm happy to, to get to the point where we're kind of winding down all this policy detail. You probably feel like I've just like shot you with a fire hose of policy detail, right? This is, this is intentional because I wanted to sort of give the effect of what, what this administration kind of felt like, um, what this agenda kind of felt like, where you just have all of these different things, and all of these different details. And this sort of political criticism that Carter was being unfocused. I do want us to kind of think about why would people receive it that way? Is that, is that a fair criticism? Is that a criticism that's really linked to this particular kind of context? Is that something you would say today? Now, we kind of people complain the government doesn't get anything done. You know, government is, is gridlocked. The two parties can't get along. And here you've got an administration that's actually focusing on a lot of things, fighting a lot with its own party, fighting a lot with Congress, but also the things are getting done. And not everything's great, not everything's perfect, but they're, they're accomplishing some of the things that they said they would do. I do want to move briefly, though, to what's not there. I think this is really notable given, given the scope of the Carter agenda. What's not there is a kind of front and center set of civil rights proposals. And at this point, we've been talking a lot about presidents and race and civil rights and uh, kind of constitutional struggles around that. But it's really remarkable for a Democratic president 
first Democratic president since Lyndon Johnson to just really not be addressing this in, in a party where this has been such a main point. It's been such a political struggle and where African Americans are still such an incredibly important constituency, civil rights activists are still part of the, the broader party coalition, and there's things there. But Carter's, Carter's ideas on race are about business opportunities, they're about support for historically black colleges and universities, and that's actually look kind of like Nixon's. They're very sort of based in economic opportunity. And that's, that's not nothing. That's not to say those things are bad or necessarily good, but, but it's different than having a more comprehensive plan about federal involvement and in, in equal opportunity, um, about bolstering voting rights. And these things were important to the administration, and there's plenty of evidence that Carter was, Carter was invested in these ideas. He agreed with these ideas, that even as a, as a person in the South, that he had actually borne personal cost as a business person not joining these kind of reactive southern uh, white citizens councils and things. But when it came to being president, it just wasn't at the top of his agenda. Um, and his, he has sort of a mixed legacy for that reason. In the, in the early part of the administration, the Supreme Court heard a, a big case on affirmative action. And the administration was really torn internally about exactly where to go with that. But they ended up kind of coming out in, in general support of of the concept of affirmative action. But again, it's kind of reactive. Yeah, really. Did any of his campaign focus on civil rights? Like, were there uh, broken promises, I guess, or empty promises with that? That's a good question. Yeah, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a campaign focus either. I mean, it was, the campaign was a lot more general about this kind of good government kind of idea. Yeah, it wasn't really a front and center um, campaign. And you sort of see that also in, in the way the electorate shakes out. Right, Carter was quite, um, quite popular in the South. And it was really like the safe bet. Carter took the safe bet in the general election in that sense of not, not pushing at that. Yeah, great question. Anyone else? So I want to spend the rest of our time here really um, bringing down the, the legacy here. And everyone see that? I have a different motif for legacy. Um, the first thing is how we think about presidential strength and weakness. And I think that this is, we see this both in the really kind of symbolic and superficial stuff, like Carter wearing jeans in the White House, um, or appearing on TV, he's on TV in his cardigan telling everyone to turn the thermostat down, um, and also in these kind of major foreign policy moments of the country maybe you know, not always being able to assert dominance in every, in every foreign policy interaction of things like the Panama Canal Treaty, of approaching things from a human rights framework rather than more of like a, a dominance power politics framework. How does this shape how we think about presidential strength? It really shapes the kinds of, the kinds of symbolism and the kinds of words and language that that presidents use. Um, I think that it made presidents really hesitant to use this kind of trade-off language or to talk about things not going so great. One of the most famous moments with Carter, and this kind of topic happens in 1979 when he gives what's, what's commonly known as the Malaise speech. We heard of the Malaise speech. Um, but also it was kind of known in the administration as the crisis of confidence speech. And talks about how the country is kind of experiencing this kind of low point and this crisis of confidence and that you know, we, need to, we need to come together and kind of figure out where we're going. There's a fairly recent book about this that actually says we've totally misunderstood the speech. And says, in fact, after this speech, that people were responsive to Carter talking about the need for national sacrifice, for people, people talking about the need for kind of the national mood to shift and for the people of the country to do something to make things better instead of just promising that the government would deliver better. This, uh, the, the person, Kevin Matson, who wrote this book, says, actually, after that, people wrote in and they said, we will make sacrifices to conserve. And you know, we will do this. And that people were quite responsive to the speech and that it was just everything that happened after that, things kind of fell apart. 
Carter's cabinet resigns and the administration goes into some turmoil over that. The economy continues to be bad. You start to have uh, the hostage situation and things falling apart in Iran. And like the, those are the things that really brought down the administration, not him misspeaking about this, this Malaya speech. So there's kind of a debate about that legacy. But it was still received at the time as like the, the American president can't go on TV and just say things are bad. The American president can't go on TV and tell the American people what they're doing wrong or what's wrong with them. And that, I think, has really, really took hold, really took hold through, um, through the following decades. What do, we, what do we think about this? Is, this? is this good or bad for a president not to be able to address the American people that way? It's kind of like, there's kind of this sense of, well, Carter is just being a, being a downer. And we want to have a president who's going to tell us that we're great, the country is great, that we're all doing fine, and we aren't going to acknowledge trade-offs. It's one of the ra ways that I kind of read this, this legacy. Carter's legacy is in what is strength and weakness and it becomes this kind of legacy of a roadmap for what presidents shouldn't do. The last piece of that is this sort of uh, emphasis on big picture versus details, that it's kind of weak to be overly invested in the details. This is a different, I mean, this sort of plays differently depending on who's, um, who's president. And we kind of shift back and forth between the, these different kinds of presidential images of is the president too nerdy, too invested in details, unrelatable. When Obama was running, people used to say he was professorial, like that was a bad thing. Um, versus, you know, not invested enough in the details, not invested enough in reading. And so this was a common, this was a common critique of Trump. It was a common critique of George W. Bush. And I think kind of a framework from that era as well of, is it bad to have a president who's over-invested in the details of a situation versus maybe under-invested? And so it leaves us with this kind of open question about how presidents might navigate that trade-off. Questions about this? Comments? I've thrown a bunch of questions at you. Ponder. You'll have time to ponder. We'll come back to these questions over the course of the semester. Carter leaves this kind of, again, I think what, what I want you to take away from this is that Carter does leave this sort of roadmap or like kind of an anti-roadmap for what presidents should avoid. They should avoid looking over invested in details. They should avoid being negative. They should avoid asking people to make too many sacrifices. And I think a lot of presidents since then have kind of acted accordingly. The, the kind of coda to this I wanted to add in. This is a, a little bit of a last minute added. This is a rabbit incident from 1979. Anybody know about this? All right, Corey, you're smiling way too much back there. You know, what, what a way in on this? He was canoeing and he was attacked by a rabbit and the press didn't believe him, so he brought up photos showing him in a canoe near a big rabbit to prove that he had in fact been attacked by a rabbit. So this is the, the only photo that I'm aware of. This is, this is a very different era. Um, there's not a lot of footage of this. Um, but yeah, so he was canoeing, and apparently the, the descriptions of this are like it was a, a swamp rabbit, and it wasn't like a cute little bunny rabbit. It was the wild animal, and it jumped into the canoe, and he had to hit it with a paddle. No one really knows, but here's the picture. And this also becomes kind of like it develops its own lore, and there's all these kind of rumors about what members of the media had said in private to, um, to Carter's press secretary, Jody Powell, about you know, what, what had happened, but also like how they were thinking about it. And none of this is, is confirmed particularly well, um, but it's this idea the press is like, this becomes a symbol of Carter's failure in the Iran hostage crisis and his failure in the, with the Soviet Union. And like, the idea is this president can get attacked by a rabbit and he's like, making himself look weak by having to like, beat down this, this sad little creature. And, and this becomes, again, like this sort of second level set of rumors, right? No one is even really sure if these behind the scenes conversations happen. Um, 
But Joni Powell, the secretary, press secretary, writes a book in the 80s kind of trying to tell people what, what really happened. The president confessed to having had limited experience with enraged rabbits um, and that it was truly a wild animal. But it kind of exemplifies this relationship with, uh, with Carter and, and the media. Kind of takes us back, it kind of takes us back to Watergate. Remember we talked last week about how important the press and like the press being a little bit aggressive with administrations, how important that was in the Watergate story. And we see like Carter's a different person, circumstances have changed, but elements of the environment are still there and Carter is still contending with this sort of idea of a, a news media that really wants to expose the, the weaknesses and the foibles of an administration. And so with, with Carter, it's, it's many different things um, that are quite newsworthy, but also it's this sort of lore around this rabbit incident. Um, and that kind of illustrates this weakness point. So if everything else I said was boring and you're going to forget it, you're going to remember this rabbit. The second bit of, of legacy here that I, I want to address um, is Carter's legacy in the Democratic Party. And here, I mean, this is kind of weird because ex-presidents, whether they lose, win, whatever, leave term limited, always have kind of an odd relationship with their parties. Sometimes they are kind of the elder states persons of their parties. But also, it's, you know, their time is done, and sometimes it's time to let other people, um, other people lead. But Carter influenced the trajectory of the Democratic Party, in addition to still being um, somewhat of a figure within the party. I think one of the things I really want to draw your attention to is that the thing that was probably the, presented the most challenges for Carter and was the most responsible for the problems that he had is the legacy that really stuck. It's a legacy that did become a kind of positive roadmap for later presidential candidates. And that's this outsider idea. That is the idea that parties should nominate people who are a little bit fresh from the mess in Washington. This is where you start to see a lot of governors being nominated and elected to president. That, that change kind of happens with, um, with Carter. And so this idea of outsider politics, this idea that the nomination system, the primaries, the Iowa caucus where you can drive back and forth through the state and meet everybody, New Hampshire, another early primary, I think you literally have to meet every single person in the state if you want to win that primary. That is a real advantage to an outsider candidate, right? You don't have a lot of name recognition. Well, I'm going to go to the diner and get name recognition. Um, that sticks. That becomes a thing. And so Carter has this lasting imprint, on, really on both parties, but um, on, particularly on his own. The second is we do see the Democratic Party moving to the center under, under Carter. This becomes a thing through, certainly through the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s. The Democratic Party starts to move away from its New Deal roots, starts to think about adopting some of these more Republican frameworks about the size of the government. Thinking back to that slide with the inflation speech, the regulation speech, the idea that the government is going to play this big role in people's lives and that it's okay to talk about building out government, building up new cabinet departments, new regulations, that becomes a lot less popular. And we associate all of that with Ronald Reagan, who we'll talk about after spring break. But Carter is really one of the early people to articulate these ideas and very early on the Democratic side to be articulating them as a sitting president. And so, of course, that causes kind of a, a fault line between these more traditional Democrats and then this kind of new strain of thought within the party. And finally, we have a new role for the South. The South has been lurking all throughout our semester. We've had a lot of experience with the South kind of being the kind of veto point, being the constituency in Congress that presidents are worrying about, playing a role in nominations. But now we've had a, someone from the Deep South as the president um, it's a fairly unusual thing in the 20th and, uh, and even 19th centuries since the Civil War. Um, but it's a new South. Carter is part of this kind of cohort of new and more moderate to liberal um, Southern governors. So we're actually seeing real changes in, in that region as well. And you do see through the 1980s this sort of idea in the Democratic Party, similar to this move to the center, of kind of trying to pivot toward the South, trying to win back the South, 
um, and to make these appeals that are kind of in a, a moderate, modern democratic mode as opposed to the old Southern Democrats or, on the other hand, the kind of old school New Deal um, Northern liberalism. So Carter actually has a really profound effect on these shifts within, within his own party and within the ideas in, that are floating around in the country. So this is the last one, the last piece of legacy I want to talk about, and in a lot of ways, sort of the deepest one. This is probably the kind of image that you're most familiar with, with, uh, with Carter. Anyone know what he's, he's doing there? This is a couple years old. Is he's that, building a house. He's building a house, yeah, with, with what organization? Anyone know? Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, with Habitat for Humanity, which he didn't start, but he and his wife kind of built it up. And so he is, this is a couple years old. If you see, the, if you can read the caption here at the bottom, it says Carter returns from surgery to build homes for Habitat for Humanity. And again, this is not that old. This is only a few years old. So he's like in his 90s. Um, this is really the post-presidency legacy of Jimmy Carter. So we have the Carter Center which he and his wife did found that has been really devoted to election monitoring, democracy promotion throughout the world, and also disease eradication. So Carter has been really active in this idea of eradicating diseases in the developing world. Um, and then on the other hand, um, building homes with Habitat for, for Humanity, which Carter is out there physically building these houses. Um, and that is really the post-presidential legacy of Carter, and it's often presented as a point of contrast. That on the one hand, Carter wasn't very good at being president, is this sort of the way this goes, but on the other hand, you know, he's just this wonderful and humanitarian human being. And one of the ideas that I think really got deeply absorbed into the political culture is that those two things are just at odds with each other. That you can't be a kind of Sunday school teacher kind of person and also be a successful president. And that's one of the, the legacy ideas that I think might need to be revisited and probably will be revisited as people rethink Carter's legacy and rethink what happened while he was president. What do we think about this? Why do you think we, we might treat those things as being so, so different? This idea that if you are this kind of really service-oriented person, you can't be an effective president. Do we think this is true? What do we think? Who's in, who thinks this is true? You want, you want to say why? Go this, for it. Maybe this, this is like a generalization. Politics tend to like be perceived as like quite a ruthless field, mm -hmm. and that's not really what like oh, the Sunday school teacher, like this service-oriented guy, mm -hmm. that's not the type of image that that gives off. Uh, it seems like the type of image that would actually get like kind of swallowed up by politics. So just like the nature of the two kind of proposed. Okay, yeah. I mean, you think like if you all have taken a like an international relations class, you've probably played like a game or done like some game theory. And this idea in politics, like you've got to be thinking about how you're going to like play a power game of politics, right? You're going to think of you're not thinking about like oh how can I help this other person, you're thinking about how can I win? You have to think strategically. This, is, this really drives how we think about politics. Again, this is a really powerful uh, kind of theoretical paradigm in international relations, but also in other, in other areas. Um, so this idea of being ruthless doesn't really mesh with being a, a good person. Anyone else have thoughts on this question? I don't really, I don't really have an answer about whether whether these things are fundamentally different, whether this is just someone who is very effective in one con context and very ineffective in another. But I think it deserves revisiting that one of the things that really got absorbed into the, the culture is the idea that these things are totally incompatible. And with a case of one, and with people kind of coming off of the end of Carter's presidency, quite, you know, quite raw about the whole thing. There's this sort of international, humiliation, that there is this terrible inflation, that all of these things are sort of bad, um, that that might lead people to make a very general conclusion that might not actually be always true. It um, might not be the case that it's, it's not ever possible to, to bring these two things together. And it seems a little bit, to me, a little bit quick to give up the game 
quick to give up the idea that the presidency can be kind of compatible with service or democracy or a lot of the constitutional themes that we've been talking about. Um, the, the presidency just can't be reconciled with those. And so I think that we will see as people revisit Carter's legacy, kind of revisitation of whether this presidency was, was more effective than people think. Um, whether the things about Carter that kind of foreshadow his post-presidency, his kind of emphasis on human rights, his emphasis on vision, his emphasis on the environment, that these things actually you know, were parts of the presidency that had some success or that brought something good to the table. And maybe that that's, it, it depends on where you look to assess the Carter presidency. Other thoughts about this? Okay, so I'm going to kind of close us up with Carter as a transitional president, uh, both for the country and for the class. So we kind of identified Carter here as a transitional president around this idea of the old party systems kind of going into decline. We see that with the change in nominations. We see that with the kind of decline of this New Deal Democratic Party. And Carter comes in as president, again, who really makes this outsider vision a very popular way to run for president, a very successful way to run, to run for president. Um, we have moving away from this kind of ideas of bigger government toward an idea that government should be efficient, pared back. Um, and this really complicated inheritance for how, how strong the presidency should be. So on the one hand, the sort of craving for stronger symbols, for presidents to avoid a kind of rabbit moment at all costs, to be really attentive to how it looks like they're negotiating with Congress, to be really attentive to how it looks like they're negotiating or relating to international actors. But at the same time, the Watergate baggage also hasn't gone away. So they're also contending with an environment in which there's suspicion of the government for being corrupt and dishonest and all that kind of stuff. So it adds in this sort of Goldilocks and the three bears kind of expectation for, for presidents. If, if Nixon and the presidency up to that point was kind of too strong and then Carter overcorrected and was too weak in his manipulation of those symbols, presidents now have to kind of think about how they're going to present themselves as, as just right. And that gives, that's really constraining. So I think Carter is a really important kind of turning point in how we, how we think about the presidency and, and how we think about the post-Watergate presidency. For us in this class, Carter represents our transition between our constitutional unit, where we've been building up, through, talking through these themes about how presidents have enacted their constitutional obligations, how they've navigated the demands of civil rights and federalism, um, and now we're moving into a period where we're going to focus on the public presidency. So again, we're back in this idea of how do presidents relate to the people? How do they re relate to their parties? How do those things sometimes pull them in different directions? How do they relate to social movements? So that's where we're, that's where we're gonna pick up um, next time is really delving into that, um, delving, in, delving into that unit. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions? before we wrap things up here. Okay, so for next time, Thursday, we are really peeling back. We've kind of talked here about how Carter related to the New Deal coalition and the Democratic Party. We've gone over that, but we'll really be back in that. We're really gonna immerse ourselves in that on Thursday and kind of move backward in time and ask, how do we get here? Um, so that will, be, that will be a lecture on FDR and the Democratic Party for Thursday get excited. Um, but thus far, hopefully this poses some questions about the Carter legacy that we can, we can chew on over the rest of the semester. That was Julia Azari, political science professor at Marquette University. Are you interested in hearing more about past presidents, the lives they led, and the world they lived in? Check out American History TV, either on our website at c-span.org forward slash AHTV or on C-SPAN 2 every weekend from 8 a.m. Saturday through 8 a.m. Sunday. Explore our nation's past with American History TV.